This will be part three on God's holy days, are they for Christians today? One of the most baffling scriptures that theologians use, and as a result they teach the membership of every church, is Ephesians 2.15. And they use this particular scripture in order to prove that God's law is done away, the holy days are done away, and therefore we are free in Christ. But free to do what? They don't go on to say, and they just talk about the law of Christ, but they can't identify what the law of Christ is because they don't understand who the real Jesus is, that he was the very creator of all mankind. He's the one that placed Adam and Eve on the earth. He commanded the man in the Garden of Eden, and later he actually codified the law when he instituted Israel as a national experiment to show the world what would happen if God's laws were lived. But, of course, we know it was abysmal failure because Israel did not keep God's laws. And yet, for the brief time that they did, it was a success. So millions of people have been deluded or deceived into what we might call a tunnel vision. This is ministers and laymen alike have focused in upon this particular scripture and they've fallen into the very trap that the Apostle Peter warned about. And that's found in 2 Peter 3, verse 16. They warned about Paul's writings. He said, as in all his, referring to the Apostle Paul in the previous verse, epistles, speaking them in them of these things in which some, are, some things are hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable twist, as they also do the other scriptures referring to the Old Testament. And notice the last phrase of that particular verse, though. It says, unto their own destruction. So what we want to do is focus in on what the Bible really says, what it really teaches, and not twist or pervert because we want to avoid destruction. And this warning was put here by the Holy Spirit to protect New Testament Christians so that we might not go into destruction. And it refers to the unlearned who are twisting scriptures. So therefore we must at all times when we're formulating doctrine and truth in the Bible look to crystal clear basic fundamental scriptures and then understand the hard to be understood scriptures by the very clear scriptures. So let's go on and let's see what Jesus Christ actually said. So we need to believe Jesus Christ, after all, he's the one that came, he's the one that commanded Adam, he commanded Israel, he's the one that stood on Mount Sinai and Moses saw him from the rear and then he actually spoke with his voice which created thunderings and earthquakes around Mount Sinai and he gave the law with his own voice. This is Jesus Christ, who was Jehovah, the God of the Old Testament. So what was Jesus' testimony in referring to God's law, God's holy days, his statutes, his judgments? All right, let's turn to it. I know that we've all read it before. But in John 17, 17, Jesus said, Thy word is truth, referring to God's word. And he said in Psalms 119, verse 142, Thy law is truth the truth. So if God's word is truth and your law is the truth, wouldn't God's word and the law be synonymous, synonymous with truth? Sure it would. All of God's word is his law. He understood it. Jesus did. So why don't we? And I think we need to get into it. Psalms 82 <clears throat> verse 6 reads like this. It is written in your law, I said ye are God's. Jesus quoted that from John 10, 34, but it was a direct quote of Isaiah 82, 6. And the law actually states in Psalms 82, 6, the potential of humanity to become sons of God. So Jesus knew the scripture. This was a direct quotation out of the Psalms. And he did not relegate the law only to the Ten Commandments and the first five books of the Bible, which Moses was inspired to write. But the testimony of Jesus Christ is clear if we're willing to look at it. So let's do Matthew 5, verse 17 and 18. Think not. Now this is what Jesus says. People, don't think I'm come to destroy the law or the prophets. And yet every Christian denomination practically that you can name believes that Jesus came to do away and abolish the law, which includes all of the writings of the Old Testament. He says, I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. He came to fill it, fill it to the full. And as it says in Isaiah 42, 21, Christ was prophesied to come and magnify the law and make it honorable. When you make something honorable, do you do away with it? No. It's honorable so you can live it and keep it. 
He said in verse 18, For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all is fulfilled, or all has been performed. And we know that the entire law has not been performed, and the prophets have not been performed as yet. So the law included all Scripture, including the prophets, and none of it was to be done away, none at all. That's why Jesus said in Matthew 4, 4, Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. So it's every word, not just the ones that someone selects for their own usage, but it's every word in the Bible to be properly divided and understood. So it's imperative that we literally fill our minds with a testimony of Jesus Christ. And Jesus, the testimony of Jesus Christ is the spirit of prophecy and it's every word written in the book because the book is the testimony of Jesus and how he deals with people and how he offers us salvation. The spirit of Christ was in all the prophets. This is found in 1 Peter 1, verse 10 and 11. All the prophets of old had the spirit of Christ. David was a prophet. In Acts 2, verse 29 and 30, this proves that David, King David, who wrote the Psalms, was a prophet. And one of his Psalms, 111, verse 7 and 8, this is what he had to say and prophesied about the law of God. The works of his hands are verity and judgment. All his commandments are sure. They stand fast forever and ever and are done in truth and uprightness. So this absolutely proves, according to the prophet David, that God's law is there. So the question is, do we believe the words of the testimony of Christ? I believe we do. None of the commandments of God are done away. And the scripture, according to John 10, verse 35, cannot be broken. If there is a scripture, and it's very clear, and it says the law of God cannot be done away, that means if another scripture seems in some way to contradict it, it can't do it. There has to be another explanation. There has to be a mistranslation. So we have to go back to the original Greek because no two scriptures in Bible can contradict each other. Can't do it or else none of the scriptures are valid for us. So God's law is obligatory upon Christians today, both physically and spiritually. Because how can you spiritually keep the law of God without physically doing it? Because we're living in a physical body. So... <clears throat> In Matthew 5, 19, we see the results if we believe Christ. One of the results is if we believe the commandments and we do the commandments and teach others, then we'll be called great in the kingdom of God. But what happens if someone comes along and says, Oh no, the commandments are not for us. And they refuse to keep one of the least commandments, such as the Sabbath. And then they enforce that and teach that upon other people. They will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. I think it's only logical if we're sincere and wanting to go all the way with God, we want to do his will. And we want to be called greatest in the kingdom of God. So we've seen a crystal clear scripture. And we've also seen a scripture that says Paul's writings are hard to be understood sometimes. So now let's go in to this Ephesians 2 verse 15 and lead into it gently. Both Jew and, Jew and Gentile both have sinned. Not one person has ever been to, stood up to the full glory of Jesus Christ and God the Father. Both, as a result, are cut off because of sin. We're cut off from God. The Jews had a wall constructed in the temple, and it actually separated the Jews from the Gentiles. This was called the middle wall of partition that was in the temple. It physically separated people. And yet, both Jews and Gentiles alike are sinners. We have all been separated from God. And it verifies that. Romans 3, verse 23. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that does not mean Gentiles. It means all, Jews and Gentiles alike. So this barrier of religious difference is what had to be broken down. And it was. So in Ephesians 2, verse 12, we see that the Gentiles, at the time before their conversion to Jesus Christ, were without God. They were actually strangers. They were aliens before they'd accepted Jesus Christ, before they were obedient to God's law. So they had been disobedient in times past. Verses 1 and 2 of chapter 2 state that. 
Then in verse 3, Paul points out that we all had been disobedient to God's law, both Jews and Gentiles. So there were none that was righteous. So now, in Christ Jesus, though, according to verse 13, we are made near by the blood of Christ. We can actually come near to God because of Jesus Christ. Because He is the one that's come on the scene and forgiven our sins. Now, it's by the shed blood of Jesus Christ that this middle wall of partition has been broken down that has separated Jew and Gentile. Now, this was a physical erection right in the temple to separate the Gentiles from the Jews, even though the Gentiles had accepted Judaism. He also broke down this wall separating both Jew and Gentile from God. He broke it down so that now both Jew and Gentile are one new creation in Jesus Christ. Verse 14 points that out. So now, verse 15 shows exactly what happened. Having abolished in his flesh the enmity. Now, most people think we're talking about God's law because it was against us. God's law was against us. But what is enmity? I think that's the very first key is identifying what enmity is because Jesus Christ in his flesh abolished the enmity. So whatever it was... Both Jew and Gentile alike were guilty of it. So now, let's go to a plain scripture that literally tells us what enmity was. Romans 8, verse 7. Romans 8, verse 7. Because the minding of the flesh is enmity against God. So it's our natural mind that we're born with without God's Holy Spirit the natural fleshy mind that we're born with. And and there's nothing wrong with that. We're born that way. God made it so. But he made it that way so that we would receive salvation. He didn't make us completely of spirit, perfect to begin with. He made us perfect human beings. And then we made the choice whether to sin or not. But because of the surroundings around us, plus we are physical. And the physical senses just can't pull in of the Spirit of God. The eye, the ears, the touch, the smell, it just cannot assimilate information about God. It takes an outside source, which is the Holy Spirit of God. That's what destroys the enmity that you and I have against God and against God's laws. So both Jews and Gentiles have this enmity against God. Okay, let's continue the verse. For it, this natural mind that we're born with, is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. So Ephesians 2 verse 15 begins to become clear. If Jesus Christ abolished the enmity when he died by now giving his Holy Spirit, now we can no longer be hostile toward the law of God. So both Jew and Gentile had broken God's law. So as a direct result, they had been disobedient by nature because we're natural, we're fleshy, and we're not subject to the law of God. We don't want to keep it. We're hostile toward it. So the enmity of our natural mind against God is contrary to God's law. As a result, we can't keep it. But now, with the addition of God's Holy Spirit into our minds, the requirements of of God's law can be met in Jesus Christ. And with Christ in us through the power of His Holy Spirit, now the enmity is abolished. So it becomes more clear. So as a result, the Apostle Paul made a statement in Romans 7 verse 22. Now that he's in Christ, he says, I delight in the law of God after the inward man, God's Spirit. In Ephesians 2.15, what did he say? having abolished in his flesh the enmity. And the enmity was against God's law. It was hostility or hatred toward God's law. For to make for himself of two, the new or one new man, now that we're obeying God's law, so making peace. And now we're literally making peace between ourselves and we're making peace with God. So again, let's read verse 16, or at least part of it. And that he might reconcile. Notice what he's doing. He's reconciling both, that's Jew and Gentile, unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity. He didn't slay God's law. There's nothing wrong with God's law. It's perfect, converting the soul. And we'll see what this has to do with the holy days in just a minute. 
So both Jew and Gentiles, by nature, were at odds against God's law. But now both can be reconciled to God in Jesus Christ by Him abolishing that enmity when He went to the cross. So now both can be obedient and we can delight in God's law rather than being hostile toward it. So it's by the testimony of Jesus Christ, all of God's word can now be kept and we'll want to keep it if we have a spiritual mind now that we're in Christ. So now that Jesus Christ has gone to that stake, there should be no more hostility against God's law if, and here's the big if, if we have truly repented and if we have received of the Holy Spirit of God, if we have received God's Holy Spirit, there will be no more hostility and we'll be seeking truth on a continual basis. We'll not want to lay aside anything that God has for us. We'll not be hostile to his law, his commandments, his statutes, his ordinances, his, his judgments. Nothing will be a stumbling block to us anymore. And this is verified in prophecy. And we can read it in Ezekiel 11, verse 19 and 20, that God said he would put a new spirit in us. And it says, I will give them one heart, and I will put a new spirit within you. And, I'll get, and I will take the stony heart out of your flesh and will give them a heart of flesh. So it will no longer be the hostility, the hatred, the hard attitude of man. But through God's Holy Spirit, he'll give us a sincere heart and he'll replace that hardness with the love and the joy and the mercy that's found in Galatians 5, 22 and 23. And why would he replace the old stony heart with a heart of flesh. And why would he give us a new spirit? It says so in the next verse. That they may walk in my statutes and keep my ordinances and do them. This is a prophecy from the Old Testament of the new covenant that we would be keeping the statutes when we receive this new spirit. And what are the statutes? Leviticus 23. Verse 14, 21, 31, and 41, every one of them identify the holy days of God as statutes forever. And this is amazing. Because why is it that the ministers of this world do not go into the prophecies regarding the new spirit that we were to receive in the new covenant and tell us, right there it prophesies we will keep God's statutes and will desire to. So we should rejoice and be glad that there is no longer any enmity against any of God's word if we're a New Testament Christian. But what about the law of commandments and ordinances? The King James Version of Ephesians 2, verse 15, it seems like God is abolishing some law contained in ordinances. And it's very hazy. So what is it? The word even is in italics. And it doesn't even belong. It was added by the translators to try to, supposedly, to make it clearer. But I've read several people's research on this particular scripture and then looked up the various words myself. And it should be, if you were going to add anything, it should be added which was against. So it would read like, he abolished the enmity which was against the law of commandments contained in ordinances. So he was abolishing the enmity which made our hearts be against God's laws, statutes, judgments, and so on. So there's absolutely no way that one little set of words can do away with all the other crystal clear scriptures that we've seen. And especially the prophecy of Ezekiel 11 which prophesied that we would keep God's statutes and his ordinances and do them with this new spirit that he would give us. So many falsely claim that the holy days are carnal ordinances. And we covered that in part two of this series. They're not. They're statutes forever. And that's found in Leviticus 23, 14, 21, 31, and 41. And the statutes of God were in existence hundreds of years prior to the Levitical priesthood. To be exact, Abraham, as we've already shown, kept God's statutes. Genesis 26, 5. To be exact, in the very first part, or the first tape on this series, we saw in Genesis 1, verse 14, that the holy days, the sun and the moon, were set in the heavens to determine the festivals. All the way back 
before there was ever a man, because the sun and the moon were set in the heavens before Adam and Eve were created. So there's no way that this could be doing away with the holy days of God. To be exact, Jesus said in Matthew 25, 35, Heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall not pass away. So how can the prophecies of, of Ezekiel 11, prophesying this new spirit, where we'd want to keep his ordinances and we could walk in his statutes, be done away when Christ said not in any of his words would be done away. So let's see which ordinances would be done away. If there are ordinances, which, one would be, which ones would literally be done away? The only ones in scriptures... Anywhere in the scriptures which we are told to forsake are found in Leviticus 18, verse 3. And Jesus Christ, remember, is the God of the Old Testament. He was the creator. He made Adam and Eve. He commanded them in the garden. He's the one that told Noah to build an ark. He's the one that led Israel out of Egypt. It's the same Jesus Christ, 1 Corinthians 10, verses 1 to 4, that led them. And so he stated, After the doings of the land of Egypt shall you not do. And after the doings of the land of Canaan shall you not do, neither shall you walk in their ordinances, not his own ordinances and his own statutes and judgments. You're not to walk in the carnal ordinances of the world, paganism. So the ordinances of the world, such as pagan holidays that are dressed up and called Christian, are not to be kept by any follower of Jesus Christ, neither any of the pagan sexual customs. On the other hand, Jesus says in verse 4, Leviticus 18, verse 4, You shall do my judgments and keep mine ordinances to walk therein. I am the Lord your God. This is what Jesus Christ said in, in, when he recorded it in Leviticus 18, verses 3 and 4. So we should be glad that Jesus knew the truth of his own ordinances. And that he can identify for us what we should be doing in New Testament Christianity. And we should be happy that we can now live by every word that proceeds out of God's mouth and never under any circumstances let anyone call us into question for any practice of the Bible which we do. And Jesus said, whatever he spoke was eternal. He said that in John 12, verse 49 and 50. He said that whatever he spoke was eternal, it was forever, and it was for our life. The words that I, Jesus, speak unto you, they are spirit and they are life. And Jesus was the God of the Old Testament that said we were to keep his statutes and his judgments, that we should live in them. But then let's go right on and identify the pagan holidays that we are not to observe so that we can make sure we understand what days we are to observe. So there are those, and most of it is in the Protestant ministry of the, in the world and the Catholic ministry, who blatantly come right out and claim that Galatians 4 verse 10 does away with God's holy days. And yet, as we're going to see, it doesn't even refer to them at all. They further hold the idea that the scripture gives permission to avoid observing God's holy days. Permission to avoid it. But let's look and let's see. Once again, I want to remind you of 2 Peter 3, verse 16, where Paul stated clearly that Paul's scriptures were many times twisted by the unstable and the unlearned. And therefore, utter destruction was in their paths. So let's not be caught twisting the Apostle Paul's scriptures. So for your own safety, I always admonish you to double-check everything that I say Double check everything that you read in Newswatch magazine. Don't believe me, but prove it. First, First Thessalonians 5 verse 21 says, Prove all things and hold fast to that which is good. So now let's go into Galatians 4 verse 10. Let's state it. It says in the part I'm referring to, You observe days and months and times and years. Now let's look at that at face value. Let's don't read into it what people say. Does this say you observe Pentecost, Days of Unleavened Bread, Feast of Tabernacles, Passover? Does that say that? It doesn't say that at all. It says you observe days, months, times, and years. Then if we don't assume that it's God's holy days, 
then we don't have to assume they're abrogated and done away, do we? If we don't assume something, then we can look into the truth of it and find out what it's really saying. But first of all, who were the Galatians? We need to understand that. Who were they? Why did Paul write to the Galatians? All right, first of all, they were Gentile converts and had come from a background of pagan practices. Pagan, not godly. They didn't even know who God was. We'd already read in Ephesians 2.15 or previously in that whole chapter that Gentiles in the flesh, before they came to Jesus Christ, were cut off. They were without God in the world. So now suddenly, Paul is telling Galatians, which is another Gentile converted group of Christians who had come from a pagan background that they should not be observing days, months, times, and years. All right, so let's go and let's not be afraid to look into the background of these people and find out what Paul was telling them. So Galatia was in the re a region around in Asia Minor. There were churches such as Lystra, Iconium, Antioch, Derbe, and there were other cities there too. But this was all a part of Galatia. And these were all churches which had come from Gentile backgrounds. They were not Jews who knew the laws of God. So let's look now at Acts 14, verses 8 to 18, to get a little more of the background of this Galatian area. Paul was used by Christ to heal a man born in a crippled condition. He had been that way from birth. Look at verses 8, 9, and 10 in Acts 14. As a result of this pagan Gentile background, these people wanted to worship Paul and Barnabas, thinking that they were actually gods who had come down into the human flesh. They actually named them Jupiter and Mercury because one of them was the chief god. That was Paul. They even wanted to do sacrifice to them, verses 11 through 13. But Paul and Barnabas finally stopped them. He finally restrained them from going through with a sacrificial worship of them. That's verses 14 to 18. Now, this is the background from which Paul is writing this letter about observing time, days, months, times, and years. So now we can begin to see just a little bit about what he's having to deal with. So this is precisely why Peter, or why Paul told them in verse 8. Galatians 4 now, verse 8, as to, as to how they were, were prior to this particular uh, conversation, how they were acting. How be it then, when you knew not God. Now, this identifies it. <clears throat> Remember in Ephesians 2, the entire chapter it said, before they knew Christ, they were without God in the world. Here it is again. Galatians 4, verse 8. How be it then, when you knew not God, you did service unto them which by nature are no gods. And they tried to worship even people as gods coming down to them. So they had been slaves to gods that were not gods at all. They didn't know the true God. They had been worshiping demons, as it were. It was, it was out of this pagan superstitious background that Christ used Paul and Barnabas to convert these people to him. Now someone was trying to beguile them. After he had been there, taught them God's ways, now people were trying to beguile them and take them back into the same situation in which they'd come out. And that's also the same situation in which Paul found himself when writing to the Colossians in 2 verse 14. They had been in 16 and 17. People who had come out of the pagan society were now being pressured and intimidated to go back into the same system they'd come out of. Now let's read Galatians 4 verse 9. But now, after you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn you again... Notice, they had come out of something, they had turned to the true God, now he's asking them, why are you turning back to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto you desire to be in bondage? Why go back to something when you've already been relieved of it and taught the truth? So what were those ways that they were turning back to? Verse 10, they were observing days, months, times, and years. They could not be returning back to God's festivals because they didn't even know them until the Apostle Paul came and preached to them. They were already wrapped up in the pagan system of the world, the days, months, years, times of the pagan society around them. 
And suddenly Paul and Barnabas came on the scene, taught them God's true way. They started keeping them, and now suddenly they're going back. And they're turning away from God again. So now let's look at the ways of pagan worship. The heathen followed certain customs of observing particular days. You can go to any reputable encyclopedia and look under the term festivals, and you'll find what they observed. One of them was called the Saturnalia. That's on December 25th every year when the sun goes to its lowest ebb in the southern hemisphere and suddenly it starts coming back and it's called the rebirth of the sun. The days are beginning to get longer. Today it's called Christmas, but it has nothing to do with Christ. It's the Saturnalia, one of those pagan holidays. What about the Feast of Astarte? Okay, this is nothing more than a feast where they made cakes to the Queen of Heaven. Today it's called Easter and it has a company at the hot cross buns. And you can find that in any reputable encyclopedia. The further back you go in history, like uh, Encyclopedia Britannica, maybe the 11th edition, years and years ago, the better it'll be and the more accurate before they started watering down truth. Then there's also All Saints Day or Halloween, as we call it today. And then there was the women weeping for Tammuz. And Tammuz, today, it's called Lent. You give up something for Tammuz. See? And this was nothing more than the illegitimate birth of the child that is pictured as the mother and child. It is not Mary and Jesus. It's Semiramis. And Tammuz is exactly what it is. But these were the days. These was how they began to worship in the pagan society. But when we turn to Leviticus 19, verse 26. Leviticus 19 Verse 26. Now I want to turn to that and read it. Leviticus 19, verse 26. You shall not eat anything with the blood, neither shall you use enchantment nor observe times. This is what God instructed because the pagan societies in the land in which they had gone were full of paganism. And God instructed them not to do the same things that were being done in the land. Then Deuteronomy 18. Deuteronomy 18, verse 10. There shall not be found among you anyone that makes his son or his daughter to pass through the fire, child sacrifices, or that uses divination, or an observer of times, or an enchanter, or a witch. Then down in verse 14. For these nations which you shall possess, hearken, they listened unto observers of times and unto divinity. Uh, they were demons. They were observers of times in the heaven, the 12 signs of the zodiac. And that is rampant today. And God says, don't do it. And don't worship him the way the pagans worship their gods. So these were the times in which God, or which the Apostle Paul was dealing with in Galatians 4 verse 10 the same signs of the zodiac, and so on, that the Gentiles were observing when God sent Israel into the land. So this is absolute proof that a, that a person need to obey what God was giving, the holy days and not the pagan holy days. To observe times was a heathen practice of divination of the heavenly bodies and how they circled in their orbits. So in Greece, it developed into regular seasons. They would have entire seasons where they worshipped these heavenly bodies. But the law of Moses, as given through Moses, and we call it the law of Moses, absolutely forbids the observance of times as we saw in Leviticus 19.26 and Deuteronomy 18, verses 10 and 14. The Gentiles that Paul wrote to were being hoodwinked into going back. They were amalgamating Christianity with paganism and calling it Christian. They were told not to do it. There are certain times such as pagan, the pagans use called Easter time and Christmas time. Aren't those times of the year? Sure they are. And these are the very times which Paul was talking about. But these superstitions, times, which Paul forbids were pagan customs. They weren't gods. These were the same pagan customs practiced by so-called Christians today. And it was being practiced by, and it was really instituted heavily in the days of the Catholic bishop Chrysostom. This was around the 4th century. And I want to quote from a work which proves it. 
from Bingham's Antiquities of the Christian Church, page 1123 and 1124. It says, Many were superstitiously addicted to divination. In the celebration of these times, they set up lamps and marketplaces and crowned their doors with garlands, as is done today at Christmas time. This was all done way back in paganistic societies. So what were the days that is mentioned here in Galatians 4? It couldn't have been holy days because they were coming out of paganism and now they were turning, returning back to something. So besides these times, there were also special days in which they honored the dead. And these were especially so by the Greeks. And the rites took place, and I'll quote from Rest Days, page 79. The rites took place on the unlucky days accompanied by complete idleness and cessation of business. So several churches today celebrate pagan days in honor of the dead, such as All Souls Day, and they call it All Saints Day now. But at that time it was called All Souls Day. And by the world in general it's called Halloween. And yet Paul forbade Christians to observe these heathen days. And the days the Gentile Galatians were returning to are the same old pagan days that were now being masqueraded as Christian holy days. From Rest Days, page 306, I quote, Many of the holy days in the religious calendar of Christum, Christendom were borrowed, as it was well known from the festivals of ancient paganism. And yet the Apostle Paul dogmatically told them, don't go back into these things. This is New Testament. And we also confirmed it by the Old Testament that God said, don't participate in these pagan days. And I want to read something else. This time, I mean, really God thunders a warning at us. And that's found in Jeremiah 10. And these are the days that God said, don't observe. Jeremiah 10, verses 1 to 4. Hear you the word which the Lord speaks unto you, O house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, learn not the way of the heathen. Don't learn it, is what he's saying. And yet, what are we doing in Christianity today as a whole? Are those who claim to be Christians, they're learning the ways of the heathen. God says, don't do it. Be not dismayed at the signs of heaven, for the, heaven, or, or the heathen are dismayed at them. Verse 3 of chapter 10. For the customs of the people are vain. For one cuts a tree out of the forest, the work of the hands of the workman with an axe. And we saw that on television last night. A man had cut down a Christmas tree and was dragging it across the yard. And I made that statement to Linda. There's exactly what Jeremiah says don't do, and they're doing it in honor of God. Verse 4, they deck it with silver and with gold. They fasten it with nails and with hammers that it move not. This is what God says don't do, and what do we do? We observe it. I had an interesting phone call, I think it was uh, Wednesday, about 1 o'clock. And the man wanted to be a missionary. And he wanted to know if he could work with our association. He was, he was new. He was coming out of the Catholic faith. He had just started believing the Bible and reading a few scriptures. And he was totally illiterate to the scriptures. But his heart was big as gold. I could tell that. And he made a statement about a certain church. And he said, they don't even believe in Christmas. And I very gently said, well, I don't either, and then began to explain. And suddenly he silenced, and we continued with the conversation. But when I told him, and I read definite scriptures to him, then he at least didn't pursue it, and suddenly he didn't want to condemn it anymore. So there may be hope for that man to come out of paganistic Christianity instead of and, and obey all of God's ways. So let's go on just a little more about these pagan days, and then we want to get in to God's calendar for today. There were numerous days that were observed as idolatrous festivals by the old heathen idolatry. These days concentrated, or they consecrated certain deities of the state. They were religious cults, and these were, they had unlucky days because of the influence of their gods, see? So these civil and religious days were regarded, and I quote, from Rest Days by Webster, page 171, they were regarded as unsuitable for many purposes, both public and private, for battles, so they wouldn't go to war on certain days, levies, sacred rites, journeys, and marriages. They wouldn't get married on certain days. 
They wouldn't travel on certain days. We're told they owed their unlucky quality to the pronouncement of the state and pontiffs. So now, has anyone ever heard of Friday the 13th? This is only one of their days. Has anybody ever heard of hotels not having a 13th floor? This is all a part of the pagan society. The observing of days, times, and customs, which God says, don't do. So as many as a full third of the days of the old Greek and Roman calendars were marked as unlawful for judicial and political business, according to the book Rest Days. And this is very interesting. So it's no wonder that Paul spoke of these days, times, years. <laughs> they set aside whole segments of the calendar and refuse to work and so on as unlucky. So how many of us today, even in Christianity and who claim Jesus Christ as our Savior, have the exact same beliefs instead of the beliefs and the holy days that he laid down in Scripture? I think most of Christianity does. And yet you ask many and they say, oh, we know it's not the birth of Christ. And yet they go right ahead and do it anyway when God says, don't do it. All Paul was trying to do, he was attempting to educate the Galatians to give up these foolish and superstitious practices that had been ingrained into the lives of these heathen people. And he was trying to get them to go back in and stay with the holy days of God. So in Galatians 4 verse 10, Paul also mentions months and years. This is another heathen custom and it still goes on today. So heathen festivals were held during the months of the year in honor of the Greek gods. You had Apollo, they had festivals during April and in October. Zeus, you had festivals in February and June in honor of Zeus. And then in honor of Artemis, you had a festival in April. Bacchus, you had a festival in January in honor of him. And there were others. You can look under festivals in any reputable encyclopedia and it'll probably give you all of these in detail. The Encyclopedia Americana under the article festival has a great deal to say about this. So that's at least one. But never in all the Bible did God command his people to observe months. Period. Whole months in honor to their God. That's why Paul was trying to correct the situation. Even in paganistic times, certain whole years were set aside biannually and then quadrennially, every four years or every two years, in honor of some god. These were paganistic practices which they were involved in. And then when these years rolled around, they would have certain Olympic games. The Olympiad was during these pagan festivals. Then they had other, the Pythian games. All these occurred during these every two or every four years set aside in the heathen societies. When Christ and Paul were on earth, many of the present so-called Christian holidays were being celebrated by the heathen. And that's why he had to constantly write to the Gentile churches and he's not doing away with God's ways at all, but he was trying to get them to come out of this paganistic society. But we can know God, and we can know whether these things are true or not. To know God is to keep his commandments. And to know God and to keep his commandments also includes keeping his statutes. 1 John 2 verse 3 says, Hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments commandments. This is important because the Galatians had been converted from heathen customs to know the true God, the God of Israel, to keep his commandments. And to know him meant that they were keeping God's law and that they had turned from sin and breaking God's law to now observing God's law so they wouldn't reinstate the death penalty which had been abolished. The indictment of death had been abolished by the Christ. When he nailed it to the cross, Colossians 2 verse 14 clearly states that. Paul didn't want these Galatians, once converted and keeping God's commandments, including his statutes, to go back to their previous idolatrous system of days, months, years, and times. That's why Galatians 4 verses 8 to 10 was in this particular context. But now, let's go one step further. We can understand all of these things. We can understand that we are to come out of the paganistic society of the world. 
But have we come out all the way? That's a question I want to ask. Because, frankly, I want to learn truth. I want truth. I don't want to be puffed up about knowledge. I don't want to be puffed up about truth. I want to remain humble. Because, see, it says, God resists the proud. In James 4, verse 6. But in verse 10, it said he gives grace to the humble. I want truth. And that's why I've been digging into this to present this information on the holy days. The calendar that the Jewish people of today use, is, which determines the holy days of Leviticus 23, is not the calendar of Scripture. And that is easily provable. Very easily provable. The Jewish calendar, and it literally is a masterpiece of mathematical calculation, but it's not God's calendar found in the Scripture. Which, help, which helps us to accurately determine the keeping of the holy days and the months of God. The modern Jewish calendar and their calculation was not even constructed until after 300 A.D. And they even state that in their own writings. And I've got quotes from it. The Bible clearly shows that God's sacred calendar and the way he revealed it through Moses had 30 days in each month with a slight variation in hours and minutes and so every so many years you have to intercalculate or uh, put an additional month to keep it within the range of the seasons of the year. But notice what was recorded in the days of Noah. The flood began in the second month and on the 17th day of the month. That's Genesis 7 verse 11. Okay, it stopped on the seven, seventh month and the 17th day. That's exactly five months later. As Genesis 8 verse 4 shows that. This period of time was exactly 150 days. All right. The indication is that each month was approximately 30 days. Because it said the flood, the flood was upon the earth for 150 days. Which was five months. Because it began at a certain time and it ended at a certain time with a moon. Genesis 7 verse 24 and Genesis 8 verse 3. Need to read that. Put all those together and you can see it was five months and each month was approximately 30 days. So the indication is that each month had 30 days. Therefore, each year was to be 360 days in length. But now remember, because each day is not exactly 24 hours, okay, and according to the rotation of the sun, which we determine days by, therefore each month would be a few hours and a few minutes off not a full 24 hours each day times 30. So, but you had to keep the holy days during their proper seasons. And there is a proper season for keeping the holy days. Now, we want to quote right quick Genesis 1 verse 14 again. This was all the way back. And I read from seven translations in the first part of this series. Seven different translations to show that God put both the sun and the moon in the heavens for the keeping of the festivals. And God said, let there be lights in the firmament of the heaven to divide the day from the night. And let them be for signs and for seasons. The Hebrew word season should have been for keeping of the festivals. And for days and years. And he put both the sun and the moon, verse 16... And God made two great lights, the greater light to rule the day and the lesser light to rule the night. He made both the sun and the moon, and both has to be taken into account when you're discussing the holy days and when to keep them. So the sun, that's the solar, and the moon, that's the lunar, both have to be used in the determination of the festivals. All months begin with a new moon. Isaiah 66 verse 23 shows that very clearly. The middle of the month is a full moon. That's when it's big, totally round. You can see it in its fullness. All the festivals of Leviticus 23 are determined by the new moon that begins the month. Now the festivals were also designed for the agricultural seasons as determined by the sun. In Exodus 13 verse 10, it states that they were to be kept, and I quote, in his season from year to year. If we go by the calculated 
Jewish calendar of today, you can actually be starting a new year, not in the spring, but in the winter. And we've done it before. We've done it. The capability of harvesting first fruits in the spring and the full harvest in the fall helps to determine when the festivals were to be kept. And so it had to have been in conjunction with both the sun and the moon. And if the spring crops were not mature enough, the religious year would not, or it wouldn't start. It would be postponed for one month later so the maturity of the crops could be arrived at so that they could bring their first fruits and their wave sheaf offerings to the temple. All this is important in understanding how to determine the holy days. And while the temple rituals were still in operation before 70 AD, the seasonal feature always had to be taken into account because they had to bring their first fruits. They had to bring, well, the first fruits came at Pentecost, but their wave sheaf offering, they had to bring that. So the motions of the sun were acknowledged by the priest in their determination of the calendar. It had to be the sun. The sun is what determines the times of the year, such as spring, fall, winter, and summer, and so on. So this was necessary so that the proper time for the celebration of these rituals of the wave sheet offering, and then later the first fruits, and then at the end of the year when the great harvest occurred so they could take their tenth, their tithe, to the Levitical priesthood so they could live on it for the next year. And so all this had to be taken into account. And if we start a new year in the winter time, and the first fruits and the wave sheaf could not be collected, then why start it? It had to be postponed a full month until the crops were mature. So the present Jewish calendar avoids the commandment to watch the state of the crops around Jerusalem for the determination of the beginning of the new year. It's entirely a calculated calendar today without any reference whatsoever to the motions of the sun or the moon. It is totally calculated. So the Jewish calendar today has been reconstructed and not from the Bible at all. And we'll see that in just a minute. It's very easily to see. Okay, here's an example. The present Jewish calendar prohibits, now listen to this, the first day of each month from occurring on certain days of the week. All right? The seventh month, which is the Feast of Trumpets, according to the modern calculated Jewish calendar, cannot occur on a Sunday, it can occur on Wednesday, or it can occur on Friday. Now, what if according to the Bible, and according to the sighting of the little faint crescent of the new moon, which the Bible shows is the way to determine the beginning of the new year, the beginning of the month, what if it were to allow the first day of Tishri, or the Feast of Trumpets, to fall on Sunday, Wednesday, or Friday? According to the modern Jewish calculation, they just postponed it one day. Well, we'll see why in just a minute. This new rule, which was devised after biblical times and didn't even come into existence until about 400 A.D., it prevents the weekly Sabbaths and the autumn from occurring in conjunction with the annual holy days. In other words, you cannot have an, a Sabbath day and an annual holy day back to back. Now, it can start on a Sabbath, but if you have a Sabbath, then you can't start it the next day. It can start on a Monday, though. Irregardless of what the Bible says, this calculation changes it around. And it can't start on certain days. So you can see right there, what if the sighting of the moon, which is the only biblical way to determine a month and the new year and the keeping of the holy days, it's the only scriptural way, suddenly what if? it were to occur and here you and I know this to be true and yet the Jewish calendar says we start on Monday and we know according to the Bible we should start on Sunday when we sight that little faint crescent in the western sky what are we going to do what are we going to do <laughs> remember the Jews have not accepted Jesus Christ they're without God in the world they don't have God's Holy Spirit that's why they don't go but this book are you and I going to follow them in their error or are we going to seek out all the truth we can find and then come to a conclusion and then do it? Well, this is very difficult. 
Because every church organization that we know of, well, no, I know of some that observe it according to the Bible, but all of them that we've been familiar with in years past and that we have grown, come out of and grown up with, you might say spiritually, keep the Jewish calendar, which is an error. And they know the difference because I'm going to read from their own literature in just a minute and prove that they knew the truth but refused to do it. But we'll get to that in just a minute. This new rule of not allowing a holy day to come right behind a Sabbath, this rule came into effect in the middle of the 4th century A.D. And the Mishnah, now this is a part of the Talmud, which is the Jewish writings, and it is not the Scriptures. Remember, this is the Torah, the first five books of the law. The Talmud, the Talmud was the oral tradition that was finally written down on paper, and that's what the Jews go by today. Not the Bible, but the Talmud. So in the Mishnah, the earliest part of the Talmud, Talmud, which was composed about the beginning of the 3rd century, this rule didn't apply. So when they were first putting on paper the Talmud, the rule that a holy day could not come right behind a Sabbath didn't exist. They were still keeping it by the sighting of the moon. Okay, but let's go on. And that's found, and you can actually go into the Talmud and look that up in Erubin, E-R-U-B-I-N, chapter 3, verse 6, where it shows that that new rule was added in the middle of the 3rd century. And though the modern Jewish calendar, it prevents the day of trumpets, that's the new civil year for the Jews, from happening on a Sunday, this was not so in the time of Christ, nor for two full centuries before Christ. 200 years at least before Christ, and you can find that in the Talmud also. Shabbat, chapter 19, verse 5. Shabbat is S-H-A-B-B-A-T-H, where it shows that the first day, or trumpets, could occur right after a weekly Sabbath. The month of Elul, E-L-U-L, -L, which is the sixth month in the calendar, sometimes had 30 days, and this was in the times of Christ. And yet the modern Jewish calendar never allows it to have but 29 days. So you can see what's going to happen there. You're going to gain a day every so often. And what if this continues? You're going to get a couple of days off eventually. And that's found in Danby, the Mishnah, page 125, for proof that they never allow the sixth month to have but 29 days. So one such day, coupled by never allowing the, fir the first day of the seventh month, trumpets never occurring on Sunday. What if it did? And then they postponed it a day. That's two days off. So you could come up to two to three days each year being off. Now, I want to read an article. This is from, from the booklet, God's Sacred Calendar, 1967 and 1968, written by Kenneth C. Herman for the Worldwide Church of God. And at the end, if there's any further questions, we're to write to Mr. Herbert W. Armstrong for further information. I want to read from this booklet, which proves that they knew the truth of this but refused to obey it. A new year is to begin in the spring. And then, they quote, Exodus 12, verse 2. This month, which is Nisan, N-I-S-A-N, shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. I'll continue the reading. The beginning of this month and of all God's months is determined by the appearance of the first faint crescent of the new moon in the west just after sundown. You have probably never been told in your life to look for the faint crescent to start the new month. And yet right there it is. I looked through about five different years in a row where this was published and it gave the same information every time. And it didn't start changing until a person who was not a member of the church took over that organization and began to change it. He actually was a part of the same organization which the Jewish and he lived by the Talmud. The astronomical new moon calculated in the United States is a day or two earlier. So according to the Jewish calendar, in 1982 we kept the Days of Unleavened Bread and the Passover two days early. And we kept the Feast of Tabernacles one day early because we went by the Jewish calendar and it was calculated instead of the faint crescent in the sky. Well, I kept it both ways so that I wouldn't offend anyone. And that's why we had the Feast of Tabernacles an extra day so that those who already had discovered all this information would be able to keep it 
the proper way, as well as those who had never even heard of such information. So here it is anyway, and there are other scriptures which we can look at. Proof that the new moon begins the month, and I'll give just a few of these scriptures, is found by comparing Psalms 81 verse 3 with 1 Chronicles 23 verse 31, then Numbers 10 verse 10, Numbers 28 verse 11, Numbers 29 verse 1, and Leviticus 23 verse thir- or 24. Leviticus 23 verse 24. The terms beginning of the month and new moon are used interchangeably. And you determine that by the light, faint crescent in the western sky. And that's how you see. And that is the beginning of the month, according to God. It is not calculated. <coughs> Excuse me. Besides this, if the new moon... See, now all these errors which the Jews put in through their calculations, not allowing the first day of the seventh month trumpets to allow on a Sunday, okay, plus they wouldn't allow or cert- the sixth month only 29 days instead of 30 sometimes... It said, if the new moon is calculated on the modern calendar to occur on or after the hour of noon, after lunchtime, it is the next day that becomes the first day of the month. Well, see, that is never a problem if you look at the little faint crescent in the sky. You see it. You know it's there. You start the day. And even in ancient Israel, if there was a cloud-covered sky, they had runners from all parts of Israel that was looking for the new moon. And if they had two people to verify they saw the new moon, they started the month right then. If they had no one to observe it and see it because of the cloud covering, they started it the next day. So you can even calculate the faint appearance of the new moon in the sky with absolute accuracy and not use the rules of the modern Jewish calendar. But there's just one or two other items and then we'll conclude it. The present uh, Jewish calendar is very well constructed for its purposes, but its purpose is wrong. It is, if we are to follow it, then we are going to be in error. But it was not constructed from the astronomical, to be astronomically correct. The assumed length of the year is too long by six minutes, 39 and one-third seconds. Now, if this is the case, just think, how many day, how many hours... Okay, six minutes. How many times would you have to go around before it became, or how many months before it became an hour, a day, and then two days? So over a period of time, like 216 years after this calendar went into effect in around 400 A.D., within 216 years, they had already lost one day. So even today, by 1977, the Passover was actually observed in the winter time winter time according to the Jewish calendar so now I want to read just two quotes from authorities and you can look this up and find it yourself so would anyone ever think and I mean any of us and anyone who ever listens to these tapes and who wants to keep the Passover and the Holy Days would we ever think that the observation of the Passover would come in the winter time no we wouldn't If there's anything that the Bible makes clear is that we're to keep these particular days in their seasons. And it always forbids the keeping of the Passover because of the wave sheep offering. And then also the first fruits to be offered. It always forbade it to be any time other than the spring. So Josephus, who was a Jewish historian who lived about the time of the apostles, or in and around that time anyway... And he was a priest of the first rank. He stated the rule for Passover, that it had to be a springtime feast. That is found in Antiquities, Book 3, number 10, page 5. Philo uh, Judius, an Alexandrian Jew who had lived in the time of Christ, was well acquainted with all the Jewish beliefs of that day. This is in the time of Christ. And he said that Passover occurred... After the spring equinox. And that's found in 10 festivals, chapter 11. It's always after the spring equinox, which starts the spring. There are other Jewish sources also that we could read. I only want to read one, and it comes from Eusebus, Church History, volume 32, page 18. 
These writers explaining questions in the regard to the Exodus say that all alike should sacrifice the Passover offering after the vernal equinox in the middle of the first month. And in every case, it's after the vernal equinox. And I think this is one thing that we need to realize, is that the sun and the moon both determine the keeping of the festivals. We cannot ever have a new moon, a sighting in the winter time to occur before the vernal equinox. It always must be after the vernal equinox to start the new year according to God's calendar. So never can there be a new moon that we sight before March 20th or 21st and then determine the holy days for the rest of the year from that. It always has to be after the vernal equinox of March 20, 21st, or 22nd, right in that period. The first faint crescent in the sky after that is when we determine the holy days. This can be found in Babylonian cuneiform. You know, they used to write on tablets. And they actually had the same calendar as the Jews. The exact same one. And it can be proven from Nehemiah and Ezra that they were keeping the same calendar as the Babylonians and every one of them kept the, the spring festival after the spring equinox. And it can be proven. So what this means to us is that if, if we literally want to observe the days, the Passover and the days of unleavened bread and so on according to the biblical way instead of the Jewish calculation, that means that we will end up keeping this on different times than all the other churches that we have known about in the past. Well, except a few. I know some that do. There are some who keep the sacred name, but they keep the holy days and everything. They keep it according to the biblical time, the first faint crescent in the sky after the vernal equinox. That's when they determine the year. And I know of churches such as Colorado Springs, Dallas, Texas, and I know of others that do. And I know of several that are looking into the calendar just like we're doing such as Salem West Virginia which was the group of their 70 elders which ordained Herbert Armstrong and they are looking into the calendar and they want all the information that we can collect and give it to them because <clears throat> they realize that something is wrong when you have a Passover that could be in the winter time which is not true according to scripture so anyway I presented this hoping that we can learn I don't ever present something and say you must do this, you must believe this, but I've tried to give, and give proof. We also have a booklet that can be ordered, and anyone who wants this, it's about 80-something pages, can have one. And anyone can just write to us, the Church of God Evangelistic Association, 11824 Beaverton Drive, Bridgeton, Missouri, 63044. We'll send you this composite of all the information we've got on the calendar God gave to Moses. It was written by Herb Selinski and Rob Anderson. And this will be available to anyone who wants to research further. And it has so much information in here that I couldn't even begin to give in these three short messages.